hit subscribe to the DIY Writer to support your hardworking authors and also lessen your chances of ending up as a victim in their next book. The world's largest UFO conference, Contact in the Desert, announces the launch of their eighth annual and very first virtual event. This event is focusing on UFOs in the year of science, also consciousness in the future. This will be held June 24th through 28th, 2021. Contact in the Desert is renowned for its top lineup of experts in the fields of ufology, forbidden archaeology, government disclosure, alien phenomenon, crop circles, and much more. Contact in the Desert already is the largest UFO conference in history and will now be the largest UFO conference in the virtual world. With over 60 lectures, 40 workshops, 11 panels, featured speakers presentations, virtual tours to Giant Rock, and other interactive events. Go to contactinthedesert.com for more information and get your tickets now. That's Jeff Bacon of the DIY Writer Podcast. Today, I have a fellow 80s child, S.L. Harvey, with me, and we're going to talk about Shadows of a Dream, Wells of Shadows, book one. That sounded too much like a radio announcer or something. <laughs> oh, whatever. It's a podcast. Anyway, how are you doing today? Doing well. Doing well. Yeah, so you're over there in New Jersey. I am. I'm from Jersey. Jersey? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that's better. I'm uh, I'm over in Wisconsin. <laughs> we got cheese and brats and beer. Well, that's a good combination. Got it's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> it was it was funny yesterday. We had uh, some decent weather, so we actually grilled out brats for the first time. I've got a one year old who is just now exploring food, and she could not get enough of a brat. It was like holy crap! You know, she's well, it's good to now. start them early. Yeah, getting started early. By two, we have them on beer over here. Yeah, you know, in the in the sippy cup, right? So they don't spell it, of course. Well, yeah, you can't do it with the actual cup with the nipple on it, you know, or a bottle because <laughs> it fizzes up too much. But it has to be a you know regular sippy cup. And you get the fine. sippy cup, you're good to go. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about your book, man. All right, it is uh, my book is uh, Shadows of a Dream. <sighs> Shadows of a Dream. Um, it is a. Um, it's a it's a fantasy it's a fantasy um okay. you know i um i put together my blurb which uh you know which i'm just gonna kind of read off and, that's okay uh, you know, every, of a, every time i hear an 80s child say fantasy i want to say old nova <laughs> <laughs> uh shadows of the dream is a fantasy novel mired in reality no um st uh Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We don't uh, edit that out either. It's it's really cool. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So everybody, oh my gosh, he's tripping. Oh. <laughs> it follows Stephen, uh, a once bright man trapped in the malaise of a loveless marriage and a thankless job, which aren't we all? Uh, when a tragedy well, strikes. Uh, you know, come on. <laughs> all right. He finds the world that he thought was simply a product of his own imagination is in actuality a real place that holds the key to making sense of it all. Okay. Within the world of Tyr, each person on Earth has a reflection. Stevens is a thief called Hollis the Slender. Within H Hollis, Stevens sees everything he always thought he wanted. As the two grow closer and the edges of each of their personalities begin to blur, they must work together to solve the murders of their closest friends in both worlds before joining them in death. Uh, it's what I would refer to as a portal fantasy, right? Like okay, yeah. I like to describe it as never-ending story, all grown up. Okay. So you've got uh, you've got the uh, juxtaposition of the real world versus this fantasy world. Um, it's uh, it's definitely tied into uh, tabletop role-playing games, although you don't really have to have an interest or even a knowledge of them to to enjoy it. Okay. Very cool. So, what was your inspiration for this? Well, I've been um, as a as an '80s kid. I've been uh, I've been playing D and D Dungeons and Dragons since you know the fall or the summer of 1980. So that's going on about 40 years now. Wow! So um, a lot of the um, not necessarily the characters themselves, but uh, some of the situations and some of the reactions are pulled from various gamers I've known over. Mm -hmm. over my life and you know their uh their you know wives and significant others friends family so on and so forth but it um 
it's it's been sort of kicking around in my head for probably about 10 years now took about four to to put it together and you know get it from you know first word through um uh through publishing so sure sure and you you are uh are you self-published i didn't see um... i am self-published all right self-published cool what do you think of that process i did not mind it it certainly is a um certainly is a do it yourself, you know, DIY sort of, uh, sort of process. Yes, You're responsible it for it, you know, and you have, a, there's a lot of, I don't want to say pressure, but a lot of responsibility, you know, uh, between editing and tracking down a cover artist and a formatter and, you know, learning the Amazon product, which isn't all that hard to be, be honest, but you know, it's a little bit of a learning curve. Uh, I enjoyed it. Like you take, you know, you sort of take destiny of your, of your work into your own hands. Yeah. I wasn't a huge fan of the, uh, of the traditional publishing process. Mm-hmm. Thought it was a little soul crushing. Yeah. It right? gets that like, way. Some people, you know, some people love it. Some people do a hybrid version of it where they publish some stuff, self, some stuff to go through a publisher and some people just absolutely hate it. I just like, it just, it just seemed like not only did you have to reach out, with the right work to the right agent at the right time, you had to do it at a point that they were looking for something or they were Mm -hmm. looking for that particular work. Right. Right. Like, so maybe two months later they would have been in love with it, but right now they have their full of, you know, portal fantasy or, you know, or, you know, whatever you happen to be sending them. I am a big proponent of don't tell me what to do. So that kind of that kind of conflicts with publishers. I, it yeah, just, it just does, you know. And the other thing that that ticked me off about it is that you kind of have to do your own advertising anyway. I mean, it's not yeah, like they go out there and they I really, heard. you know, they're really, you know, it's not like they're putting out, you know, any kind of you know decent advertising for you. They're trying to pull you in with their name, and I, I don't know. I just, it, you know, I. I some people get some good deals. They get into bookstores and they get into, uh, you know, certain places that, uh, you know, only a publisher can get you in. Right. And I don't think that makes a difference. Uh, I, th- you know, I think as we go more and more virtual where, you know, people are, you know, going through Amazon and, and, you know, reading a lot of things on their, their e-readers, uh, as much as I love bookstores, like I still love to go and, you know, lose an afternoon in a, in a bookstore. I don't think being in a physical bookstore is as much of a deal breaker as it used to be. Well, you know, there's, there are a ton of indie bookstores that you can, you can get your book to. I mean, if you put your book on Ingram Spark, you know, and, right. and, and, you know, maybe cut some deals with them or something like that, or else you can also ship them five copies, you know instead right. of them having to buy a case, you know, I mean, you can do all sorts of deals like that. If you uh, go wide and, and uh, um, you know, there's all sorts of online bookstores that you can go into that, you know, you can be in 130 different online bookstores and hit a wider population if you want to. Um, right. It's still only about 30% of the, yeah, it's probably less than that of the uh, actual book readers. Cause you know, Amazon's kind of got the, uh, a there's a five hundred dollar or five hundred pound gorilla in the whole uh, thing, um, but uh, Barnes and Noble, if you uh, publish your paperback with them and then mm-hmm. go into a local store and talk to the manager, really nice, give them a cup, a cup of coffee and maybe a Danish, they will <laughs> they'll actually order it, really, and stock it. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean it's not that much harder. I mean it's not any harder to publish a paperback on Amazon. <clears throat> then i mean to publish it on uh, barnes and noble than it is on amazon it's, it's okay. basically the same format and amazon doesn't care about paperbacks because nobody buys them <clears throat> <laughs> you know according to them but anyway other than that what else you got going on you got some new books coming out or yeah i'm uh i'm working on the sequel at the moment and uh sort of as i'm as i'm working my way through that i've got a couple other projects i'm working on a, a superhero uh, fiction project yeah. at the moment, which uh, really sort of uh, captured my interest. Cool. Trying to gather together a you know 
a merry band to try to do a dystopian anthology, you know, in the in the vein of like Thieves World, where you have multiple multiple authors okay. um, writing one or two characters in various short stories, and you know, you can use another author's character, but you can't kill him. <laughs> which leads to, uh, leads to some fun things where people put your characters in real bad positions and then you have to write them out of them. Yeah, that's kind of fun. Kind of keep you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing. So somebody puts a character in there and you cannot kill them, but you can... You can do whatever else you want with them, but you, you can't can have their head one inch from lava, but you can't kill them. All right. Yeah, and then, and, then the, uh, and then the owner has to try to write them out. Sweet. So. Yeah, it was it was, uh, it was great. It was, um, I want to say I discovered it maybe back, really back in the early 80s. I want to say 81, 82. It's, uh, it's called Thieves World. Uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the heavy hitters of uh, fantasy sci-fi back then, Lynn Abbey, uh, Robert Asperin. Yeah. Um, they all met up at a con and said, hey, you know, what if we all agreed on a shared uh, setting? Mm -hmm. and picked one or two characters that we would write short stories on so it's not taking a huge amount of our time sure um and we you know we'll set these ground rules you know you can you know so a given character can be viewed by other characters through that sort of eyewitness where everyone that sees someone doesn't see the same thing uh and i want to say they put out eight or nine maybe maybe even as many as 10. And then uh, Lynn Abbey took some of her more popular characters and wrote full length novels. Uh, it's a really, really enjoyable series if you get a chance to pick it up. Okay. And just like writing it, reading it's not a huge time, you know, time constraint because you can just read one or two stories and, you know, put it down. That's funny. But I, it's real gritty, real dark, what I would consider yeah. like low fantasy. Okay. Yeah. And that's the kind of fantasy I like, you know. Yeah, common man too. fantasy me too i like that uh, yeah I, I i don't mind epic fantasy um you know or high fantasy or whatever but uh, i do like the grittier stuff better i mean I still, you know the, i do the, too the darker you know um faster moving because sometimes you can you can get into like a sanderson book which will take you a year to read right and it's like oh i gotta sit this down i can't i gotta read something i gotta read some brain candy hang on and i'll be right back yeah like as a child um you know in addition to reading like lieber and howard uh and moorcock i really quickly got into like i said thieves world uh glenn cook had a series called black company which even though it it has some pretty significantly large magic, like powerful magic, the um, the, the protagonists are just normal folk. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a pseudo military uh, military fiction set in a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it's a mercenary company. It's really fantastic and gritty and nasty, and you know the. Um, the protagonists really are just small cogs in a greater machine, but that's the kind of stuff that I like, right? Like, yeah. you know, chosen one books while I enjoy reading them, like are not my first grab when it comes to, yeah, you know, uh, a, a fantasy novel. <laughs> I like taking the chosen one and then just beating the crap out of them. And then, <laughs> and by the time you're done with, uh, with it, you're, is he really the chosen one? Because <laughs> he should have, he should have won, you know. And it's like, yeah, he was chosen for something, but you know, you're not gonna be able to figure it We're out. We're not sure what. Yeah, <laughs> he chose yeah, to get a butt kicking. Yeah, it wasn't exactly what you thought, but you know, whatever. But uh, I don't know. I, I I enjoy playing with genres. I enjoy playing with uh, social issues and stuff like that, and throwing it in there, and uh, and uh, just. <laughs> You know conspiracy theories and that kind of stuff and then turn it into a dark fantasy that way nobody can criticize you yeah i mean it you know. keeps keeps it interesting as well like yeah. you know in my opinion a good book should at least at par parts defy genre yeah right? like here's a fantasy but here's a little bit of realism like here's uh here's a touch of sci-fi 
right. you know, here's a touch of, of romance or a touch of touch of suspense or whatever. Oh, romance. Yeah, you should have some of that in there. Gotta have a little bit, a little bit. Right. You know? Right. But, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever. So what else you got going on? What's happening in the uh, in the world in New Jersey? Well, you know, we're we're still uh, still pseudo locked down due to due to COVID. I'm you know I'm yeah. due to get my uh, my second shot this week, so that's uh, that'll free me up a little bit. Oh, sleepy from, time! <laughs> yeah, I work from home. I'm a you know I I, I remote work. I work remotely, so yeah. with the, the exception of not going to the supermarket as often, like COVID really didn't impact me overly much. Like yeah. I spent most of my time you know behind my computer anyway. Yeah. Gave me a little bit more time to write. Gave me, uh, gave me some time to, you know, to spend with, uh, with my, uh, with my personal pod, which is, you know, my, my, my loving wife and my, my badass rescue dog. <laughs> so, and, you know, I, I guess I could see where, uh, quarantine would be, would be problematic if you were, you know, you were quarantining with someone that you didn't, you know, didn't get along really well with, Yeah. but my wife and I, you know, we're, you know, two peas in a pod. We, oh, cool. You know, we get a who, you know, we get along really well. And you know, I love her quite, quite amount. So I'm kind of waiting to see when the courts, you know, actually do open up fully. I'm kind of waiting to see what the divorce rate's going to be. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard to be with someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I count myself super fortunate. Yeah. Super, super fortunate. Like my wife and I, we, we get along really well. We, you know, we have terrific communication. If there's a problem, you know, it's, it doesn't sort of you know, like linger, you know, which I think is the, you know, the key to a happy marriage, right? Like, you know, you don't always have to Scott. agree. You just have to, you just have to like not necessarily hold grudges or at least let people know what you don't agree on. I thought scotch was the secret. <laughs> well, maybe after. Scotch and wine. Everything seems to work out after that. <laughs> or tequila or, you know. Smooths the rough edges off a little bit. It really does. That way it opens up the communication, you know. There we go. See, we, it's exactly. Everything gets sickle. out. <laughs> That's funny. So um, so you're already working at home. So so lockdown, except for going out and doing, you know, probably eating at a restaurant and, and going yeah. to the grocery store, really didn't affect you all that much. It didn't. Um, and I tend to be a little bit of a homebody to begin with. Yeah. Well, you're a SQL programmer. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody talks to you anyway, unless they actually need a report. Unless they absolutely have to. Right. And then they write and, an email and, hoping that it, you don't respond. You just, you know, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Exactly. I know. Computer guys, you know, no one else to talk to us until they're, until they're having problems. <sighs> Somewhat. <clears throat> anyway. Or somebody has a really great idea for a report that's impossible. Yeah. Oh, I have more than my fair share of those. <laughs> what if we did this? Well, it's, you know, yeah, we could do that, you know, cost you, you know, thousand dollars and, you know, right. six months work, but yeah, you know, we, we can get to, yes, it's just what you want to, you know, what you Not want to sacrifice it for. I had, I had a situation to where I had th uh, three databases that were given to me and they're all given to me in uh, CSVs. Okay. 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 Now what we want to do is we want to combine all of this data and make one big, huge table where we can cross-reference and get demographics out of it. Okay. Should be no problem, right? Right. No identifiers. Yeah. Well, that's a no. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not getting the yes on that. No social security numbers, no IDs, no nothing. You know, not yeah, only you that, need the, something to be able to make that connection. Names, you know, one of the one of only one of the databases actually had addresses, which are you know that's never really, you know, or nobody had zip plus four. It's just like, what do you want me to do? Well, just do your best. It's like, okay, no, I can't. You know. And, <laughs> It took me like four or five months to convince them that this can't happen. This will never happen. But, uh, you know, so is the life of a, uh, of, of a, you know, computer guy, I guess. A computer guy. Yeah. My, my other favorite one is when somebody says, okay, I want Linux. I want Macs. I want, you know, PCs. I want all this other stuff. And I want you to throw it all together. And it I want be them all to simple. talk to each other. Everything's got to talk to each other. Okay. That's no problem. Here's the quote. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
you're actually going to charge us labor for this? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Labor costs more than the equipment. Well, that's because no. <laughs> that's because it's it's more work. That's because there's more work. Yeah, but you want this, you want that, you know. And not all of your workstations are up to date, so we have to, you know, do some things here and you know migrate and you know you have these old switches from you know uh 1994 they aren't gonna work <laughs> anymore you know i actually had a customer that uh that wanted to upgrade their entire system and went in looked at it and they're still running on dos Ooh, yep that's um it's like there is an upgrade for this. here's the path and here's what it's going to cost you for the software which wasn't too bad and here's what it's going to cost for the labor and here's your hardware cost because all these computers have to be replaced yeah that's that's tragic yeah it, it, it really was guess what they said no it's like, suit yourself all right dos 622 that's but, that that is terrible it really is but the nice thing is is that you know it, it had that um um it wasn't really a green screen but you know that that really crappy graphical yeah interface that that they had you know i think i think the screens were actually purple but uh <laughs> it was just oh my god it's horrible you know and it ran on some sort of a, a text-based database which is always really efficient for looking crap up oh yeah without a doubt without a doubt you know there's nothing like indexing it's kind of like uh, epic systems with their cache database oh yeah that's a great database thank you ever heard of sql but <laughs> no just kidding anyway i am nowhere affiliated with them so i'll just shut up now so um have you seen uh uh the new release uh by amazon for vela i read about it i read about it i mean i you know i've i've been releasing you know for pretty much free uh short fiction on my website yeah so you know something like that might uh you know might be uh, might be a, a direction to sort of monetize that a little bit yeah um because I, I, th I think a lot of people have been using wattpad which seems to be you know useful for them you know successful yeah. So, you know, I, I, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but I've uh, read, I've read some good things about it. I'm thinking about maybe dipping my toe in a little bit, see how the water is. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking the same thing too. I was, I was, well, I was already planning on doing a cereal just right. to see if it worked because, you know, I mean, they used to do them all the time and they're, you know, everybody's like, no, 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 you got to do a full novel. And it's like, wow, what if I did a novelette? You yeah, know, I mean, or, you some know, people don't have the time, like you said, with, you know, some people don't have the time to, to wade through a Sanderson, right? They would, you right. know, they'd rather read a, you know, uh, you know, Sleeping Dragon or like one of those, those short Rosenberg books, um, Guardians of the Flame sort yep. of style, which you can just blow through in, you know, afternoon or two. Yeah. I just, I, I really think that, that, uh, you know, I mean, people sit there and they, they binge episodes of you know whatever their favorite tv show is and you know that readers binge you know when you have a, a series you know you get three or four books out there all of a sudden you know people are buying you know in the in the read through is really good right you know um i gotta think that just a little short you know i think it's i think your max is like five thousand words per episode okay i gotta think that's 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 gotta work halfway decent you know you can you can build a novel on vela you well, know, yeah, and absolutely. release it piece by piece, and it looks like the profits are are uh, are better going through that right now. Which I'm sure Amazon will kill that at some point in time. But you know, to get get authors in there, I think the uh, yeah, it'd be nice to make a little money, you know, up front until they do. Yeah, yeah, and then they'll kill us like they do every other time. <laughs> uh, you know, but it it works out to be better than uh, Ku because um, you know it's it's I think it's a token per hundred words and whatever the value of the token is, I can't remember. Okay. And then, uh, but KU's, you know, half, not even half a cent per page read, you know. Yeah, I had, I had some decent page reads uh, first month out. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had someone read the whole book uh, a couple of days ago, but, you know. Yeah. But my KU numbers aren't, aren't stellar. Well, you know, and, and the one thing I'll, I can tell you from experience is that um, one book, don't worry about what it does. Okay. 
you know, if you're writing a series, two books, you know, about the time you get to that third or fourth book, you'll be able to figure out if it's got any kind of a hold because that's when people will start to read, especially when you uh, advertise it as a series and they see one book, they're like, and eh, we've seen too many authors write one book and then I can't get any motivation to write the second <laughs> and they never release another. And so, you know, you get all hyped up about a series and it never turns into a series. It was just that one book with a kind of a cliffhanger or yeah, that, know, that, sucks. that leaves you wanting. And so then they just kind of, uh, never mind, you know, but, uh, yeah, you know, whatever happens, happens, I guess, but yeah, you, you know, gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. You also, uh, but yeah, you know, what I noticed is that once I had three books out there, it's like, holy crap. Okay. Now people are starting to read it, you know, and, and they're starting to get read through. See, you know, you get somebody that reads the first book and they're like, you know, let's say 50, 60% of them actually like it enough to buy the second book, you know? Right. And then you get about 40% of those people that get book two that read book three. And it's like, you know, that's a beautiful thing when you see your KU numbers just kind of go, you know. Right, right. And you see, and you see some loyal readers. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's really hard to judge that. You kind of do a guesstimate. Right. On the page reads, but, you know, um, it's statistics kind of. <clears throat> it's actually imaginary st statistics. You know, you just kind of make it up <laughs> and say, I think I'm doing really good. Yes. Then you feel Helps good. You sleep book. <laughs> anyway, hope you put in, put pen to paper, so to speak. Yeah. So what's your writing process? Um, I have always, uh, I've always been, uh, very firmly in the, in the, uh, pantser category Yeah. where like, I know where I want to start and where I want to end. And then I, I just write, uh, for this new one, this, um, uh, the sequel I'm, I'm experimenting with a little bit more plotting as far as, you know, putting down some out, out, uh, putting down outline to work on, on some pacing seems to be working pretty decent. Yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm hoping to be like a hybrid, hybrid writer as far yeah. as that's concerned. Uh, I tend to listen to music. Do you? you know, as far as inspiration, like I have a, a playlist for, you know, for okay. each what? work. What's on, your play, what's on your playlist? Oh, well, as a, as a, as a fellow eighties kid, you know, I got a lot of Asia. Yeah. You know, I got a lot of like poison Motley Crue. Okay. Uh, um, warrant. Warrant. <laughs> warrant. Oh no. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the sequel, the sequel has a, uh, one of the, uh, one of the protagonists, uh, is a real badass, uh, you know, badass, uh, girl. So I, you know, I, I dipped into some of the, uh, uh, some of the ladies of the eighties, like Pat Benatar yeah. and, uh, who and was Har a badass. Yeah. Who definitely was a badass, yeah. you know, from, from her runaways days all the way up. Yeah. Um, you know, so Lita Ford, Lita, Fo oh, Lita Ford. I, 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 I love me some Lita Ford. I'm trying to think, uh, some of the other stuff that I have, uh, that I have out there. And then, you know, I pick up a sprinkling here and there, um, uh, what else do I have? That's, uh, I have a little bit of Pantera, you know, okay. for some, you know, for some, for some, uh, some real sort of brutal scenes. Yeah. Yeah. That works. Uh, Rush, which, you Rush? know, if you're, if you're an eighties D and D kid, you know, Rush is, you know, Rush is definitely your go-to, you know, your go-to music. <laughs> yeah, it is. You gotta have some ACDC in there someplace. I do. I do. I've got uh, yeah. I've got some Thunderstruck, which is some newer ACDC. Yeah. Uh, some Back in Black, always always good. You know, I take a take take some inspiration from the Ready Player One, uh, Ready <laughs> Player One's uh, Spotify soundtrack. Yeah, there you go. You know, uh, kind of funny. Um, I went to this little bar mm -hmm. uh, down in Beloit, <clears throat> and there was a. Uh, it was, it was a fundraiser for somebody that had uh, an unfortunate death. Okay. Uh, untimely death. Okay. And they brought in these bands and there was this band that, that uh, um, basically they, uh, they imitate ACDC. Okay. And I'm sitting there looking at the band as they're setting up and this guy comes up and he's probably 340 pounds. Okay. And this is the lead singer. Okay. 
and you talk to him it's like how in the hell are you gonna pull this off <laughs> i mean it just it's not even whatever you know and everybody's telling me you know these guys are awesome i can't wait to hear them you know and, and they had a lineup of bands that were really good this one i hadn't heard of and uh i'm like okay so it's an acd uh, acdc cover type thing or whatever he's got two bottles of jack puts one down opens one up just takes a swig band's warming up <clears throat> you know drummer's going everything else and he goes are you ready to start he's like yeah yeah let's <laughs> let's, let's hear how the uh <clears throat> you know <laughs> the asthmatic you know it kind of sounded asthmatic to me i don't know but you know would sing and he starts singing and it is a dead ringer for acdc i could not believe it that's awesome he, he could match the tone and and uh, the pitch and everything else and he had to be 65 years old and he's just you know ripping it out sweating that's awesome. like crazy and every time there's a breath he's taking a swig of jack daniels he, i mean you know i don't know how the hell he walked by the time he was done because he had one and a half bottles done he took the half bottle with him and he's out there in the crowd hey how you doing it's like <laughs> holy sh Shit. how do you have you a, put on a hell lap? of a show right you put on it you did i mean i was i was like you know you don't need to pay tickets for acdc when this guy's around you know it's a free show That's awesome. it, it was really good i was just you know shocked so i was judging a book by its cover yeah you know yeah, which which yeah. happens but you know you're pleasantly surprised when you're wrong <laughs> yeah i was I was, and it was, like I said, it was really cool. I just, I, I, I think the first song I was shocked. And then one of my friends went up and played drums with the band. And, uh, and it was, it was just funny how laid back they were. And they're just, you know, I think he played, uh, to, um, back in black, I think is what he played to, good song. you know, and, uh, but whatever. So what else do you listen to anything newer? Um, I, um, to think um don't listen to a tremendous amount of rap i i listen to a oh. little bit here and there like i was uh i was thinking more for like the lyrics death punch guy or something well you know um listen to a little bit of uh like i want to sort of see scream metal or what I, what I used to call death metal yeah um but not a tremendous amount. Like I remember one song off, you know, but I can't remember the name of it or the, uh, or, or the band. Yeah. Uh, they had a, they had a girl bassist, which is why I, I initially started uh, listening to it, but it was good. It, the band was decent. Yeah. I just don't remember the name of the top of my head. Yeah. But you know, I'm really pretty, pretty <clears throat> set in my, in my eighties ways. In your eighties. So you have rat. I do have rat. I do. I do listen yeah. to some rat. Listen to some winger. Winger, oh, Kip, Winger. Kip Winger. Kip oh my Winger. God, I'm sorry. Who is actually a really badass musician. Right? He is. Like, you can't really judge him on, you know, on 17 well, and uh, headed he was Harvard. a he was a backup singer for Kiss, wasn't he? I think so. I think so. And I mean, then he, and and he's still rocking. Like he's still rocking out now, and he's got to be in his 50s or 60s. He's yeah. He's got to be in his fifties or sixties. I, I would guess he's in his sixties, because he was singing with Kiss, and then uh, um, I can't remember if it was Paul or Gene told him he needed to go out on his own. He'd he'd learned enough from him or whatever, and then he went out and he flopped with Winger. You know, I think he had I, only. I love I I bought Winger CD when it came out, and I still have you know I still I uh, I bought it again on iTunes. Yeah. So, you know, it is what it is. Like you I know, would guess I, you're a big Nickelback fan too. I, listen, about, I, I do have some Nickelback on my, oh, on my okay. iPod, I will say. So you're really the underdog type thing, yeah, huh? <laughs> absolutely. Asia, Europe. Europe's not bad. I like I like Europe, but like I, I want to say it was a month or so ago. Um, on 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 your cell phone, when you go to uh, Google, they give you like, you know, like a dozen or two yeah. um, stories that you might be interested in. And one of them was like the 10 worst songs of the 80s. And I want to say two or three were uh, were Europe. Um, really? Yeah. Final Countdown, I want to say it was like two. I love that song. That's my jam. You're kidding. Yeah. I kid you not. I was I was angry. Okay. You know that was written by millennials because they just don't understand. <laughs> they don't understand true art. 
Uh, but I think yeah. music has a lot, like, at least for me, music is a, is as much about like the music and the lyrics as it is about like where you were when you were listening to it on the regular yeah. or where you heard it the first time, you know, and that sort of brings back that nostalgia that, you know, props you up, which is, you know, probably why, you know, I listened to a lot of eighties, you know, yeah, it was, a, you know, what band, um, I listen to all the time, probably one, at least once a week, if not twice a week, just because I love the music. And it, it's one of those disappointing stories where they never released. I mean, they didn't release enough. And if is it's in excess, I love in excess, you know, and his untimely death and they could not reboot that band without him. And, you know, I mean, he had, he was such a, such an individual with his music. It was, it was just, it was awesome. And if he would have lived, it would have been interesting to see where they're at now. Cause I bet you they would be just as big as, you know, Aerosmith or. Oh, I guarantee else. it. I guarantee it. It's hard. It's hard to rebuild a band when, when singer dies. you know, when the singer dies or the singer or the singer just sort of up and leaves. Um, like, uh, I love Guns N' Roses. Loved Guns N' Roses. Yep, I do too. When they split up, uh, almost the entire band uh, started Velvet Revolver. Yep. It's not a bad band. Like, they make yeah. some good music, but they're no Guns N' Roses, right? There's one band that I think rebuilt itself without its, with a new lead singer that was better. I think that was Van Halen. It depends. It depends. Like it depends on what what day you catch me. I love me some Sammy Hagar. Oh, me too. To, to be honest, you know, if you know, if pressed, you know, gun to my head, like I would take Hagar over over um, David Lee Roth over Roth, just about all the time. But then I'll get you know I'll be I'll be sitting sitting writing or I'll have my iPod on shuffle and. And you know, running with the devil, Panama, yeah. jump will come on, and like it'll just it'll just change my opinion right then and there, right? Like, yeah. I I think in my opinion, Van Halen read more as a uh, as a rock and roll band with Hagar. Yeah, David Lee Roth's a little weird, right? And like, n not weird in a bad way, but he's like, an asshole. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's a little bit of a dick. He is yeah. a little bit of a dick, right? A bit but, of a dick. but you know, again, like I think a lot of their music that they put out, uh, you know, the you know albums 1984, and I think it was Van Halen too that had yep. uh, really got me going, and you know, Jamie crying, and mm -hmm. you know, those are some classic bands, I'm, right? I'm, I'm not some, taking some classic anything, albums, Yeah, I, I'm not taking anything away from those albums because I love them. And I have them on my phone, but uh, when but when, Hager was smoother. He was like, yeah. I think I think that's I think that's the word I want to use. Like the sound was smoother, right? Maybe better for radio play, maybe better for you know, for sort of fading into the background, mm -hmm. so to speak, to sort of set mood. But you know, like I said, David Lee Roth said, you know, it was it was a little bit more of a raw sound. It and was raw. there are times when, you know, I dig on that. But yeah, I would definitely say, you know, Van Hagar. <laughs> <laughs> i i honestly you know part of that is my prejudice towards sammy hagar because he seems to be like an outstanding in, individual when, oh, you, when you listen to his story and all the crap that he's done it's just like you know he seems like a genuine nice guy where where the hell did he come from you know <laughs> type thing and you compare that to the stories of david lee roth and it's like eh, yeah. you know I, I do enjoy the story where David Lee Roth and Sammy Hagar are talking on the phone and David Lee said, you know what, we can do a whole uh, revamp of Van Halen and you just open for me. And Sammy Hagar is like, what? Uh, no, no, I'm no, gonna, no, no, what? no, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> but that was kind of fun. What other eighties bands do you uh, listen to? That um, Asia's my Asia is like my band. Asia right? Again, is your band, huh? and, and and you know I'm uh, 
you know, I was, I was hesitant to mention it when the, you know, the changing of lead singers came up because obviously, you know, uh, well, maybe not obviously, because I may be the only one on the planet, that, <laughs> yeah, you, know, you know, that listens to Asia on the regular, but yeah. they changed uh, singers, they, they changed guitarists, they changed keyboardists. Um, and I've sort of followed them all the way through, yeah. but the uh, but you know much like a lot of the you know a lot of uh of the bands that it happens to origin the original lineup which you know uh musicians have called sort of a super band even though there was not a lot of folks that people in the u.s knew but they uh they started i forget his name but they started with the uh the bassist from king crimson uh, yeah, yeah, Jeff Downs, like some real powerhouses in the progressive rock movement. Right. But um, the Shadows of a Dream, like if I had to pick, like, you know, had to do a, um, like a Rock of Ages sort of, um, you know, musical. Was like, that a tribute it, to Def Leppard? Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> but it was like a... Well, like, you were in the it, heat in the moment. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to, you know, I'd have to, if I can only choose one band, it would have to be Asia, right? Like, it'd have to be Heat of the Moment, it would have to be uh, Soul Survivor, uh, Heat Goes On, that kind of, that kind yeah. of thing. Hmm. But, you know, I'm boring anyone who, you know, who, who, who wasn't listening to music between the, the between the, the, uh, the years of 1981 and 1983, right? Okay, we've, we, we've probably at this point lost everybody who is like, oh my God, I wouldn't listen to them anyway because it's not, you know, uh, you know, whoever's hot now, whatever, you know, chick singer or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, there might be some old timers out there like, yeah, you know, but there might be those few people that haven't educated themselves musically on the 80s, which would be really interesting. It, it was it was a really great decade. Like, what other decade do you have that you know where, uh, you know whether on the top, you know the top twenty or the top forty or whatever, or just normal radio play? Could you get, um, could you get, um, disco? Could you get like a like a like a, a rock and roll sort of vibe? Could you get a a rap sort of vibe? Could you get like what I would call like a bubblegum pop? Yeah. And then you also have some progressive rock, you know, uh, bands like Asia, Rush, you know, some heavy, you know, s some heavier stuff like Def Leppard and uh, even Metallica. Yeah. Right. Like it, it was just such a, you know, and again, I'm, I'm probably, you know, super, uh, you know, super um, rose colored glasses. But I, I really think it was a it was a golden time for music because everybody had a shot. Right. Like it wasn't if you don't look like this and sing like this and sound like that, you're not getting, you know, you're not getting a, uh, a contract. You're not getting on the radio. You're not making any videos. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think MTV had a lot to do with that. It did back when they used to play music. When they used to actually play music. Right. Yeah. Because you, you know, you could turn it on in the background and you would hear songs that were outside your comfort zone. Right. Outside the you know, right. the heavy metal that you were listening to or the, you know, or the, the disco or whatever else you were listening, you were into, you right. heard, oh, well, there's some Metallica. I never thought I'd like Metallica, well, yeah, but there is Enter Sandman and, and, and real Twisted badass. Sister and, you know, exactly, exactly. those guys who were like, you know, screw this, you know, and, the, and they kind of, you know, I, I don't know, I just, I, that music just did something that, uh, that most music hasn't, you know, I mean, uh, the nineties were, uh, all about impersonating things and then almost, uh, you know, trying, trying to get into that grunge. And right. The right. Which grunge wasn't bad either. Right. No, like, grunge wasn't. Wasn't we bad got fighters out of it. I most likely wouldn't have started to listen to, uh, to, uh, to bands like Nirvana, uh, if it hadn't been for MTV. Like, like right. I honestly, I believe that like if MTV had continued playing music, not, maybe not all, maybe not all music, but a fair amount. I think our music today would be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more varied, and maybe certain Better? bands would would catch on that are not that that are not sort of catching on now because people don't because people don't have the comfort level to step outside their zone, right? Like I like like I like uh, so and so, you know, I like uh, Cardi B, right? Like, and if you listen to that. 
that I'm sort sorry. of we, we have to edit that out because <laughs> no, I'm not saying I do, but like, uh, you know, for example, <laughs> like you like Cardi B, you like you like that sort of that sort of music. Maybe, you know, you don't give you know a little bit of a harder or a little bit more of a you know of a uh, of a bubblegum pop or whatever a listen because you like this particular song, you know, this particular genre, mm -hmm. but with some exposure, maybe you expand out your, you know, your musical taste. And I think that also goes, you know, a lot for books, right? Like, you oh, know, yeah. I like fantasy, you know, so I'm just going to read fantasy. But if you don't read historical fiction or you don't read thrillers or, you know, romance, um, you, A, you're not going to discover authors that you know you may never have seen and b you may not discover that you know deep down inside you know you're you know you're a romance fan right like you know right in a, in a place that you don't like to talk about at parties right <laughs> deep down in the middle of the night when the demons come out you open up your romance book <laughs> i mean i uh, i go out of my way i'm you know i'm on twitter i'm on facebook so on and so forth and a whole bunch of groups you know mo mostly are people pimping their books but yeah um i i go out of my way once twice a month you know you know because you know i'm not you know i'm not making i'm not making uh, uh george R. R. martin money but like i try to go out and buy an indie publish uh an indie published novel in a genre that i'm not you know yeah too familiar with uh, last month I read a book. Uh, it was a it was a romance book, uh, like a romance thriller, uh, by Jessica Locke. It was actually really good. Like it was really like I I not much of a romance fan. Like I can say after reading it, like romance is not my genre. But there was enough pieces and the writing was was engaging enough that you know I finished it and really enjoyed it. Left yeah. a left a review and you know. And anybody that, you know, likes that genre, you know, or likes a thriller and, you know, can oh, can work through the romance, you know, it's a, it's a book called She's Mine. And it's there's crazy. two authors you should read. Um, K.L. Allen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard of her and uh, V.S. Holmes. I haven't heard either of them. I'll have to look them up. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, um, v. I, I like what I like how VS writes, and I also like how KL writes, and I've had them on the show a couple of times each. But uh, those two, uh, very interesting. And when you read it, you know, they're just like, yeah, yeah, I just wrote this, you know, whatever. And it's like, ooh, you know, it's one of those for me, it's one of those things where I'd like to write like that. Yeah, you know, that's 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 cool. Um, uh, D.W. Hawkins is another one where I read his books and it's like, shit, I suck, you know? <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I try to, I try to my best to pull from, from authors that I like and not to beat myself up too much. Yeah. But, you know, when you, you know, I, I'm a big Stephen Bruce fan. Sure. Uh, I love the way he writes, he writes characters are always so relatable you know, and if my character half as relatable as, you know, as any of his, his characters, I'd be, I'd be perfectly happy. Yeah, no, I get that too. Um, there are, uh, some authors that, uh, that I, I read just because of their marketing and especially, you know, if, if I was to actually admit, I do read some romance, <laughs> um, it would be because I want to see what the draws to their book because they do really, I mean, they're, they're guerrilla marketing. It's just the romance authors have it down. Yeah. I, oh, I, and, I, and romance kills sales wise. Like it, it does. And I always want to see, okay, so this book, you know, and, and, you know, they, they do a awesome job of going across, you know, multi-genre type, uh, right. So I always kind of wonder, okay, what is so attractive about this book? And then you read it and it's like, oh, okay. It's just their marketing that's, that's kick ass and it's got the romance in it. You know, and right. everybody, everybody wants a love story evidently, but. And, and, you know, and I wouldn't go so far as to say they're all the same because they're certainly not. No, they're not. But what I found um, from talking to some folks that, that read more romance than I do, obviously, you know, like, um, I think it goes back to like the same reason that, you know, you love to have, uh, you know, eggs and grits in the morning, or, you know, you like to, you know, sit down with a, with a bag of, 
of the popcorn that you enjoyed as a child, right? Like, you know, romance is written in a way where it's comfortable and it's familiar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it allows you to know that, you know, if you enjoy romance, if you pick up, you know, a romance book, especially, you know, a romance book by the author that you enjoy, you know, you're going to enjoy that book. Like maybe it will kind of stretch your perceptions. Maybe it won't, mm -hmm. but at minimum, you're going to enjoy the book. And, in, and, you know, I want to say 90% of reading for me is I want to enjoy, right? Yeah. Like, you know, so, you know, I'm not looking to really stretch myself. I just want to pick up a book and I want to sit down and I want to enjoy it as much as I would if I spent that amount of time doing something else. Right. right? Watching TV, you know, playing a video game, whatever. I want to enjoy myself. Yep. Right. We, you know, I think which is why we keep going back to the same authors that have, you know, wowed us in the past. And yep. I think that's part of romance's pull is the people that like romance, it's comfortable. They're going to enjoy it. Yep. Maybe they'll get more enjoyment out. Maybe they get a little less, but they're, you know, but there's that, that, that baseline that they're going to enjoy the hell out of that book. I agree. And I think that's why it kills as much as it does. I, I fortunately, I just, it's, it's not my genre. I can't write it. If only dark fantasy would do the same thing for people, you know? Yeah. Only if dark fantasy or, you know, superheroes or zombies or whatever, you know, I hope to get to the point where like, there's a small percentage of people that like, that like, my, like my writing enough that, you know, they, uh, they, you know, it's, uh, it's the eggs and ham of their day, you know? Yeah. Well, you know. that's everybody's goal. That's what we need to do. And there is a group of, there's a group of readers out there for everybody. Yeah. I, that's, I, I absolutely. truly believe that out of the 7 billion people in the world, you know, somebody, somebody's going to like it. The question is getting it into their hands. That's, exactly. you know, and that's my main struggle. With, like, like you had to press me and, you know, my, you know, the hardest part of the writing process is the marketing, right? Like, cause you don't like, you, you want to get your book out before the, you know, before the gaze of the people that are going to read it and they're going to enjoy it, but you don't want to pay to put it in front of people that aren't, that, you know, that aren't, that are just going to click buy it or yeah. not going to, you know, not going to pick it up. You know, you don't, you don't want to waste your time. Don't want to waste their time. I think almost, I would say 90% of the authors that I talked to, say it's it's a game of inches yeah you know write I the next it. book write the next book and and i i know one guy personally that um after i wrote my first book and tried to market the hell out of it and failed he said you're an idiot don't market anything until you have four books out Oh, you know, well, that's, that certainly saves me some time and effort, right? You like, know, he said, don't even worry about it. Do your social media stuff. Do whatever is fun and write the next book. And then write the next book and then write the next book. And when you got four of them out there, then go ahead and shoot, you know, start start worrying about advertising. And, you know, that I, I didn't completely listen to him. But, uh, you know, for the most part, it's really good. It's really good uh, advice. Yeah, because if someone loves your book and they want another one, yeah. Where are they going to go? Yeah. So, but. and you certainly don't want a George R.R. R. Martin. <laughs> no, no, no. He, he, uh, but you know, people wait around for his book forever. They will. Well, it's a, it, he, the world that he's built is, you know, I don't want to say unlike anything, but it's certainly, it's certainly got a spin on it that makes it attractive, right? Like it's a grand yeah. flowing story. Yeah. In which, you know, you can't be sure what's going to happen, right? You don't know who, you know, you're, you're, right. you're pretty sure that person is going to live. That's the chosen one. And then three pages later, they die in some horrible, bloody way. Right. You know, all of a sudden, <laughs> there's a dragon that ate him. All right. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, done. you know, who's next? And uh, I read some George R.R. R. Martin stuff that, uh, that predates Game of Thrones. Yeah. And, you know, he, you know, he definitely has a style that I personally find interesting. He wrote a whole bunch of stuff for the, uh, the wild cards, uh, series, which was a sci-fi superhero, yeah. uh, series of books. He didn't write all of them. He wrote some of them and some uh -oh. short stories on it. 
And I really did enjoy, you know, the stuff that he wrote. There's no doubt about it. He's a talented writer. It just he, he he's really got, needs to stick to some to some uh, some schedules. Yeah, he does. You know, it would be better for everybody if he did. But is it really better for him? And what's <laughs> happening? I mean, you know, I. It's not. It's not affecting. It's not affecting his sales for sure. You know, and it I, certainly didn't affect his pocketbook when HBO picked it up. No, a year and a half ago, I would have been. Yeah, he's got to do this. Got to do that. And, you know, and now, uh, you you know, after after the last year and a half, it's like you know what? It is what it is. You know, I get it. You know, he's you know trying to write, trying to do this, trying to do that. Plus, he's older now. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And he's got, and, and he, he almost has to make up for that for for the HBO finale. Kind of. Yeah, he, he that, was that really he, his failure? Probably it wasn't. It wasn't. But now, like, but now as he finishes up, people are going to inevitably compare the two. So, so his finale has to at least be better than that one, right? Like, and I'm, and I have no doubt that it will be. Right? If you like wrote that. thirteen pages that totally blew everybody else's everybody's mind, it would still be better than the HBO finale. Yeah. I mean, and I was, I was a huge fan of the show. Like, I want to say right up, even in that last season, I want to say right up to the last two or three, I was still with I, yeah. them. I was with them. I was like, I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And then the last, you know, last two episodes, two, three episodes, I, I just like, you know, I became physically angry. <laughs> the, the one thing that I, it felt like to me, is that the the uh, the screenwriters and the producers of that show just one? It, it was almost like one day they just kind of like, you know, what, we're done. All right, we're yeah. just going to write an ending. <sighs> you know, yeah, it, it did feel super rushed, like because you you build up the White Walkers, you build up you build up all this, you know, this epic sort of conflict from multiple locations. And then within like five episodes, you're like, we're done. Yeah. It it's was, over with. And they, it, they, they it could have, cheated. they could have extended that probably three or four episodes and probably in, and done a decent job to where everybody wouldn't be kind of like, Oh right. my God, did right. I just waste my life on game of Thrones? <laughs> you know, I have every season on DVD except the last season. And, you know, and because, and I used to watch it like I used to watch the, all the seasons before it premiered again. Like I was super like into Game of Thrones. Yeah. And now I just, you know, every time I look at them on my shelf, I'm like, yeah, I could do that. But mm -hmm. I know how it ends. <laughs> <laughs> and it ain't good. <laughs> you know, and, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not going to make me happy again. Yep. But HBO made their money off of it, so to oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, <clears throat> you know. And I think it was, and I think it was good for the genre, right? Like, yeah, you know, because to have <clears throat> to have a show like that set very firmly in a fantasy genre, really, sh you know, just like uh, Iron Man and the Avengers showed yep. that superheroes can cross over into the mainstream, showed that fantasy can cross over in the mainstream, you know, and without yeah. that. You know, okay, so Marvel and the Avengers, all they're doing is playing to uh, us 80s kids who bought comic books. <laughs> I mean, that's all they're that's doing. That's me. Well, it was me too. And it was just like, you know, when they first came out with Iron Man, it's like, holy crap, they're actually doing something that wasn't on network TV and had really, really crappy graphics. Yeah. Wow. This is cool. And then the Hulk, you know. Uh, you know how many missteps did they have with that and all of a sudden oh, they came out with so many, so uh, many. yeah it was just <laughs> you know but uh i Iron dig on the hulk i just i just don't think you know judging from what they did i don't think he can support a movie in the way that they're that they're that they're putting them out right? no. i'm sure he can it's just they don't have the they don't have the combination like i used no. to read the hulk like I and did too. He supported, he, he supported a book just fine, and really, I think at points in Marvel's uh, life cycle, really, I don't want to say you know uh, anchored it, but definitely was a foundation of their comics, right? Yeah. But they just don't. They just don't have the. 
they just don't have the combination, they don't have the recipe for, for making a good Hulk movie. Well, you know, and the nice thing is Disney now owns that whole uh, franchise. So I'm sure they'll come up with something really quality. Not. But. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about Disney. Um, okay. And speaking of, of superheroes, right? Speaking of superheroes, um, DC is the opposite, right? Like they put out really good TV and fantastic animated stuff. But can't make a can't make a superhero movie to save their lives. I know. Like all they all they needed to do was take the Arrowverse and tell a good story, a la any of the crossovers that happened yeah. that used to happen every year, right? And have you have you watched some of their animated stuff? Like, uh, yeah, I watch your animated stuff, and then like the Arrow, you bring that up. That yeah, was, Arrow and Flash. Yeah, I mean they did a good job on that on network television. Yeah, put on the big screen, and they just totally screw it up. I I, can't I liked out Wonder why. Woman. I didn't like Wonder Woman eighty four. Like I like I thought they had a, they made a turning point with the original with with the original Wonder Woman. I think you know I I enjoyed it. I thought it I I thought it dealt really respectfully with the character. Eighty four was just terrible. See, I I can't look at it the same way you do. I guess I liked them both. Really? Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Fair yeah. Enough. I think it has nothing to do with the script either. I don't know why. No, uh, fair it enough. Just you know. <laughs> yeah, sick bastard. Yeah, I am. <laughs> but but uh, I yeah. um. I would love I would love to see the the people that they had uh, plotting the um, plotting the TV shows and plotting their their animated stuff like uh, Justice League Dark, Constantine, City of Demons, I think it was, uh, even the uh, Young Justice series, right? Like, and just put them on a movie, like yeah. put them on. But then again, I I want to say Jeff Johns was was involved with one or more of their of their dcu movies and i love me some jeff johns and you know i i don't yeah. see his i don't certainly don't see his influence i don't know you know the com the dc comic books were always dark i mean they just they just you know they had a they, they they had a different taste to them versus the right. marbles and you know which was fine i just i i'm so disappointed in, in what they've done with the movies yes yeah, so that it kind of like it, it kind of like sours my opinion on dc and i don't know why well I, um i was a i used to work in a comic book store you know weekends and nights and things and i've been you know i've been a comic reader since i don't know the early 80s definitely um and i was always a marvel guy always a marvel guy uh and then i started to list i started listening to this podcast called raging bullets i want to say back in the early 2000s and they yeah. were 100 percent a dc podcast uh and they really sort of changed my mind right like so i started yeah. picking up dc and i i love dc like i was you know i i have i sold it but i used to have the whole collection of batman eternal um which is which was a weekly batman series right like 50 a 52 issue every week 299 yeah batman series was fantastic right um and but then i think i don't know if they started to have some some issues internally or some doubts but then they launched the new 52 and i was with them on the new 52 right like i didn't i didn't like the idea that they went to it but I was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and go with it. And I enjoyed the new 52 and then they rebooted again. And I think they've just rebooted a third, uh, at least a third time recently. If, if what I'm reading is uh, you know, is true. I haven't, once they I rebooted, I think it was called rebirth. Once they rebooted into rebirth, I was done. Like I yeah. can't, you know, combined with the fact that like, you can't pick up a comic for less than, you know, four bucks now. I just, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't take that ride with them. Yeah. But I think they've just rebooted it again. <laughs> they probably did. I haven't paid attention to comic books in probably 10 years. Yeah. To it's... be honest with you. I just, I kind of lost interest in it. And and, just, and it's you know, expensive. Yeah. Like when they were six, when yeah. they were like 65 cents a piece, like you could, you could collect, you know, especially as a kid, 
you could yeah. collect three or four titles. We used and, to buy you know, those packs where they'd have, you know, three comics that you really wanted to see. And then one that was like, I've never heard of this shit. Right. And, exactly. you know, you'd pick it up and you'd, you'd read it and be like, oh, that one's pretty good too. And then you look for that one, you right. know, because you want to see, you know, but. Uh, but nowadays, like they're three, four bucks a pop. Like yep. even as an adult with like a, you know, <laughs> with like an adult job, I can't. I can't justify spending, you know, hundred dollars a month on 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 books. Yep. And I, I when I was working at, comic at the, books, comic, at comic books. books, comic yes. books, comic books. Yes. Uh, when I was working, should at the comic have a hundred dollar, uh, you know, a month budget for fantasy books. For fantasy books. Absolutely. But, um, when I was working at the comic book store, there were there were guys that had had boxes where you know, and what boxes are when you know the books come in, they have certain titles they pick up. There were dudes that were spending five, six, seven hundred dollars a month. Their boxes were, you know, basically short boxes that that we filled for them, and they came in once a month and yep. picked up all their books. I, I just don't have that kind of commitment. I guess you know. Here's the thing that bothers me. Um, between all the baseball cards I collected, and all the comic books that I collected. And all the baseball cards I put in the spokes of my bike tires <laughs> and all the comic books that ended up getting thrown out when I discovered, you know, I don't know, uh, moved to college, did this, whatever, moved right. here, moved there, basement getting wet, whatever. I've lost millions of dollars. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without you a know, doubt. Millions of dollars. And, uh, you know, that, that, that weighs on me a little bit, but <clears throat> I'm getting over it. Therapy is helping. <laughs> Hey, we're running up on a little over an hour now. All right. Believe all right. it or not. So we've gone over comic books, DC, Marvel, uh, you know, 80s music, which is awesome. We also went over your book and, you know, some other uh, great fantasy. Oh, yeah. You know, um, anything too much else horn for one hand. What's that? I Too much I horn for one hand. Not, you know, I, I used to be able to do that, but now I, ugh. You know, some some preacher someplace is going to see that on YouTube going, it's the devil. Anyway, at least we'll get some press. Hey, good idea. All right. We're going to see the devil and Je no, just kidding. <laughs> anyway, you got anything else to say to your readers? Well, um, you know, stop by, um, you know, uh, www.readslharby.com. I have some fiction, some book reviews, so on and so forth. I'm on Twitter at Read SL Harvey. I'm on Facebook, read SL Harvey. I just love to talk, you know, 80s music, uh, comic books, TV, you know, don't, you know, don't need to do anything. I just, you know, just love to chit chat with people. If you get a chance, pick it up. Shadows of a Dream, available on mm -hmm. uh, Amazon, paperback, Kindle, KU. And if any of you want to have a romance discussion with us, all Harvey, um, <laughs> you know, he's open to that too. So uh, good luck with that. You know, um, <laughs> I hear he's also, you know, he really likes erotica too. So go ahead and hit him up on his website. <laughs> now you're, now you're just, now you're just spreading rumors. I, I heard it. I'm pretty sure I'll go back and edit it to make sure it's true. Anyway, <laughs> it's been a pleasure, sir. I want to thank you it for has. your time today. Um, right. With that, I'm going to say, uh, um, this is Jeff with the DIY Writer. Uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or whatever uh, podcast medium you happen to uh, listen to and, uh, you know, for further shows and everything else. But other than that, everything is getting much better. Keep your chin up and have yourself a great day. Take care. Take care and bye-bye. Please hit the subscribe button. I get a bonus for every subscriber and I only need 1,506 more to become a full-time paid employee. Help me please.